So my career in education began as a ninth grade literature teacher. I had taught for five years in Philadelphia at a predominantly black school. And as I was teaching, I became really interested in the role of policy in helping to make schools more racially equitable. And that's ultimately what I went to grad school and what I study now. So my research thinks about how race and racism shape uh, K through 12 policies and practices, especially around the design and implementation of policies. And something that I have found out over and over again is that the, the communities that we are saying we want to help are often the communities that are not, that are not in the room when we are designing policies. Um, however, 2020 became a little bit different, especially for local communities. I'm not trying to re-traumatize anyone, <laughs> but if we remember what happened in 2020, uh, first COVID um, sent a lot of students from in-school learning to virtual learning. Um, so school was happening at home for many communities. And also there were the protests around the killing of George Floyd and activism thinking about how there have been systemic inequities in black communities for so long. And what I found is that this came together for communities to say, you know, we have been advocating for schools to change for such a long time, and they haven't been changing. Now our kids are at home, why don't we do something about it? So what I ended up studying is two case studies of two community organizations, one was predominantly black and one served black and Latinx, a black and Latinx community, and what they did is that they created their own what they thought of as COVID-19 education solutions. So the first group created micro schools, and what a micro school is is essentially you want to homeschool your kid, but you don't really want to homeschool your kid. So you send them to another person's house, and in a group of five to maybe eight students, they all learn together. So this group created that for about eight to 13 black students. The other group created what they called a virtual center, where they created wraparound services for families. So they had enrichment, like tutoring, they had like after school programming, and they also gave each family a family liaison, so families felt connected and supported during that pandemic period. So it became obvious to me as I was studying these groups is that, you know, the parents and the leaders involved, like they felt like these groups were impactful. But from a policy standpoint, what I was trying to understand is, well, what sort of matters outside of like these two groups in these two cities? And what I started to hear over and over again was something like this. Leaders would say, you know, we used to feel like the way to get change was to go to school board meetings or to have policy campaigns. But we're now thinking the way to bring change is to make school districts copy what we're doing because what we're doing here is really working. I also heard from parents, you know, when my son used to go to this old, his old school, he was kicked out all of the time. He was expelled, he was suspended. Now I'm seeing he can be in this education environment and he's not kicked out because the teachers and I are like, we're coming together to form solutions. I also heard things like, you know, at my old school, there were no teachers who looked like my child. But in this school, all of the teachers are black and brown. And so what I started to see is that the parents and the leaders, what they thought was possible of education spaces started to change. And I was really interested in that and how that could maybe shape policies and practices moving forward. And that brought me to a lot of reading. And this, liter this set of literature on the black radical imagination, I do not have enough time to talk about that right now. I wish I did. But to give a quick summary, what the Black Radical Imagination says is that when you're involved in a social movement, we could think about the civil rights movement, we could think about the feminist movement, but I think we could go even smaller to local advocacy and say when you're part of these new education um, uh, programs, right, it changes what you think is possible. It changes what you think schools can provide to you and your families, and so your imagination changes. And these imaginaries can be really important for ultimately shaping policy and advocacy moving forward. So what I'm working on is thinking about what are the consequences of imaginaries and how can imaginaries ultimately shape school policy? Because I'm a school policy scholar, so I really want to think about how what these local communities are doing can have policy ramifications moving forward. So I'm presenting four consequences of imaginaries, and I think we often think of imaginaries as like negative, but I'm not in the sense of just because imaginary happened, what could happen next? So first, if you're involved in an imaginary space, it shifts your mindset. What you think is possible changes. So now that you've been involved in these school programs, you're thinking, you know what? My local public school could be more like what I experienced in these programs. 
That then shapes advocacy. And I heard stories from parents where they would say, you know what, I experienced this in the center. And then I went to my local school and said, I need you to be more like what I experienced there. And that can ultimately influence policies. We know a lot of advocacy can bring policy change. And here, I just want to pause and say, I actually saw evidence of this. So for example, one of the groups, um, they ended up forming a partnership with their local school district to actually bring aspects of their program into six local schools. So it was a real example of imaginative ideas from a black and brown community coming in to our public school system. And then lastly, imaginaries face tensions. There's conversations and debates about what these spaces should look like and who they are for. And in particular, one of the groups that I studied served both black and Latinx families and communities, and they really had to grapple with what does it look like to create a vision of the future for these two different communities who might in some senses have different needs. And how you solve those tensions are ultimately going to shape your advocacy and your policy solutions. So what's next for this work? Um, I'm really grateful to have the postdoc that I do because it is enabling me to follow up with both organizations and to understand how their work has fared post that pandemic period. So two things I'm really, really interested in. One is understanding the policy environments that these organizations are now in and to what extent they have been able to continue their work now that most students are back in traditional schooling. And lastly, what does it mean to build multicultural imaginaries? And how do you build these imaginaries across difference? If you've been paying attention to what's going on in the Los Angeles City Council, right? Like building political coalitions across race is very challenging, but I think it's really important if we're going to see the change that we want to bring to our schools. Thank you so much.